Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about smashing physics, uh, in particular smashing of protons together. Um, so first of all, I'd like to talk a bit about what particle physics is uh, and go on to a quick how-to guide of what you might want to do if you wanted to try and find a new particle. So in particular, this uh, applies to um, what people might have heard in the news about the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Uh, so first of all, this is me, nice self-portrait I made in, uh, in Word, and uh, this you know, it's, it's about one metre tall. It's not a very accurate metre. Average height is about 1.7 metres, but I'm not really bothered about factors of two, factors of five, even the occasional factor of ten in this. Um, but let's go to something a bit smaller than this. So about a factor of a thousand smaller would be something like this, uh, this ant, about a millimetre. So just a, a note on... Uh, notation here that 10 to the minus 3 meters just means there's three zeros before the one, so it's not point, not, not one meters. So this is a, a thousandth the size of a person. So if we go a, another factor of a thousand down, we can reach something about the size uh, of a single cell. This is my attempt at drawing E. coli. Uh, so this is about a millionth of a meter, but still too big. So let's go with the same uh, step of a thousand down again, and we reach something about the size of an atom. This would, in fact, have to be a really large atom. Uh, but this is perhaps what people are familiar with when they think of an atom. You have uh, the very center, which has got most of the mass. It's positively charged. And then, uh, quite a large distance away, you have negatively charged electrons, which are going round. And this diagram isn't very accurate. Uh, in actual fact, if the atom were the size of a football stadium, uh, this nucleus in the middle would have to be the size of a pea. Uh, in fact, to get down to the size of the nucleus, we'd have to go almost two full steps to reach 10 to the minus 14 meters. And this, as I said, is overall positively charged. Uh, it contains within it um, positive protons and neutral neutrons. Uh, and this is a proton here at 10 to the minus 15. Um, and this is the largest thing a particle physicist would be concerned with. So just to, to recap where we've gone so far, uh, we started off with people at the top, and we've gone down five uh, factors of a thousand. So each of these steps, so uh, a cell is to an ant, as an ant is to a person, and we've gone down this uh, five steps. So I said a proton. It's the largest thing a particle physicist would be concerned with. Well, what's smaller? The proton itself is made out of three particles. Um, there are, these are called quarks. There are six types of quark, but the the proton is just made of two up quarks and one down quark. Um, so you're perhaps asking at this point, we've gone inside an atom, we've gone inside a nucleus, we've gone inside a proton, what's inside these? Well, as far as we know, nothing. Uh, these are point-like, they have no volume, they cannot contain anything, they are absolutely fundamental. You cannot split them. Uh, and that's true of all the fundamental particles, which are these. Um, so it looks a bit messy, there's quite a few of them, but uh, the, the top uh, two, the up and down in the, in the top left there, are what makes up the, the nuclei of atoms. You have the electron below that, which make, together they make all atoms. And then in the top right you have the photon, and that's a particle of light. And together those four things are the things that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, everything else here uh, is mostly exotic matter, stuff that when it's created will cease to exist extremely quickly. Um, so we need to, if we want to study this, we need to make it ourselves. Uh, and the way uh, we, wasn't expecting that ring, but, and the way we make things like this is, uh, is using this equation. And what physics uh, talk would be complete without talking about E equals mc squared. So this says that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Um, essentially it's saying that energy and mass are interchangeable and c squared being an extremely large number is the conversion factor. Uh, as an example of, of the use of this, um, uh, a nuclear bomb would be a device that is capable of converting uh, mass into energy using this relation. Um, an example of that would be uh, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima which um, converted less than one gram into energy. And to put that in perspective, a 5p coin is 3.5 grams. So the energy required to level the city is approximately a sixth of a 5p coin. So what we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider is the opposite of this. We're taking energy and making mass. 
Now, as you can see, a small amount of mass releases a huge amount of energy. And in a similar way, to create a fairly modest amount of mass, we need to put in a very large amount of energy. Uh, one of the ways you might want to get all of this energy in one place would be to take a, a hydrogen atom. So this is uh, a single proton and a single electron. So you then take the electron away from this, so you're left with just the proton, and then give this a huge amount of kinetic energy. So you would accelerate it to close to the speed of light. Then, in order to, to cue this energy to be converted into mass, uh, you would collide this head-on with a second proton. And then you've got the combined kinetic energy of both of these particles, um, which is then able to uh, change into these exotic particles that I mentioned earlier. And this is exactly what we do at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is the 27-kilometer ring that we use. It's 100 meters underground. And we have a beam of protons going clockwise and a second beam going anticlockwise. And they collide in three regions, uh, one at a place called Atlas, one at LHCb, and one at CMS. Uh, so uh, these are the ones in three rings here. Um, I'm part of ATLAS, which is the largest of the experiments. Um, and so I'm going to be mainly talking about that for the, for the rest of this. Uh, so let's say you've collided the two protons together and you've managed to create a Higgs. Uh, we, it would be fantastic if we could then just take them all, bottle them up and store them in, one, in a lab somewhere to study them, but we can't because before they travel any measurable distance, they will instantly stop existing, uh, and they will turn into other particles, the, the everyday stuff that we see. So one of the possible things it could do is to turn into two photons, two particles of light. Now, that's not to say that the Higgs is made of two photons. It just turns into them. In the same way, it could turn into uh, an electron and the antimatter equivalent of an electron, or two Z bosons, which are essentially heavy uh, photons. Um, it, it really is fundamental, and the fact that it's turning into something else does not mean that we've split it. Uh, so, though we can't measure the, the Higgs, we can measure the photons. That is fairly simple. Most people here probably have a device with them capable of measuring photons, namely a camera. So what we use to measure these is essentially a very large camera. Uh, and this is our camera. It's the Atlas detector. It's about 22 meters high, so that's about the same as a six-story building. And you can see at the bottom here, there are three standard people stood next to it. Uh, it really is a huge thing. So we have protons, which come in from the far left here, and more protons from the far right, and they collide in the very center of this. Uh, lots of things can happen then. One of the things, as I said, could be the creation of a Higgs, which would then split into two photons. The photons would fly out through the detector, and we can measure their energy. Uh, and this is an example of one of these events. So if you look at the top left, uh, we've essentially had protons going into the screen and more protons coming out. Um, something has been created and two photons have flown out. And you can see that by the two yellow bits in the top left and the bottom right of that green ring. Um, so, okay, we've seen an event, we've got two photons, we found the Higgs. Not quite. There are a lot of other things which can make an event that looks like this. There's a huge number. That, and the probability of creating a Higgs is absolutely tiny. So what, if the Higgs does exist, it's not that we would expect to see these events. And if it doesn't exist, we would expect not to see them. But rather, we would expect to see these events anyway. And if the Higgs exists, we would expect to see a few more. So really, the problem comes down to not do we see these, but how many do we see? And it's quite similar to trying to measure whether a spinning top like this is going to be fair. Now, I severely doubt this one will be because I just made it by eye very roughly. So let's try and measure, see if, uh, how rigged it is. So I spin it once, uh, and it lands on five. Um, that's not really enough to say that it's weighted to always land on five, just in the same way that that single event isn't enough to say that it's distribution. Um, you can see there's quite a few um, times it landed on, on one, uh, almost twice as many as what we'd expect if it were fair, uh, and that's demonstrated by the, the dashed white line, what we'd, uh, what we'd expect. And um, yeah, is this enough to say that it's weighted? In actual fact, even if the spinner were completely fair, we would expect to get uh, this many um, 
landing on one, uh, about one in 50 times. So how certain do you want to be? If we're 49 out of 50 times, we're confident that, that we've got it here. Do we, do we want this to be less than one in 50, one in 100? For particle physics, really, we want this to be less than about one in a million chance that it's just a fluctuation. And so that's, equiv that's roughly equivalent to with this spinning top spinning it 6,000 times. Uh, so looking at the data, uh, the bl solid blue line is uh, what we would expect to see uh, if the Higgs didn't exist. The black data points are what we actually measured. So with this fairly small amount of data, um, there's not really any sort of peak. So we'd expect to see a little bump in this uh, above the expected if the Higgs were to exist. Uh, and what's plotted along the bottom here is the, uh, the mass, so it's essentially what we're actually measuring from these two photons. Um, so okay, we can't see anything yet. Let's try adding a bit more data to it. Uh, so we add a bit more and there's still not really anything to, to, to see there. Um, add a bit more, and this is quite interesting now that you can see in the middle, just at about 125, uh, there's a few more events there than what we'd have expected. Um, so okay, let's add a bit more data there. And you see that, that peak is really growing now. Uh, and finally, with the whole collection of data, uh, there is a fairly large bump there. Uh, and that's um, sufficient to say that it looks like there is a new particle. Now, as I said, the Higgs could turn into lots of things. Only one of them would be into two photons, which is what I've shown here. So if you combine this now with all of the other possibilities, you can see a clear, uh, a clear peak and a clear discovery of this new particle. Um, so I said with the spinning top that you would have to spin it about 6,000 times in order to get a good measure of, uh, of whether it was fair or not. So how many times did we have to collide the protons together? Well, it was about equivalent to 600 million times per second for two years. Um, so it really took a lot of work to be able to do this, and it had to get very high statistics to be able to see such a small difference. Um, so I'd like to address a couple of questions that uh, I hear fairly frequently. This one I heard the morning after the announcement of the discovery. We found it, can we turn it off? No. <laughs> to be fair, it is now switched off, but uh, the answer is no. Because once you've found it, you don't only want to know, okay, it exists or it doesn't. You want to know where we write about its properties. And particle physics still can't explain a lot of things, such as how gravity works on a very small scale. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, I'm personally looking for uh, the graviton uh, in, uh, in, in Atlas. Um, and really, if the Higgs isn't what we expect, then that might give a clue as to where we should be looking for new physics. The second question, which I think is possibly the more important one, is what are the applications? And I'll be honest, I have no idea. And that's not to say that there aren't applications. When people um, found uh, x-rays, they didn't go out looking for something which could be used in medicine to look at bones. They went out purely out of uh, scientific curiosity and found them. And then other people found applications for them. The same is true for finding out about the nucleus in atoms and that being then used for, say, MRI machines. And later the discovery of antimatter and the knowledge of positrons is necessary for PET scans. So though I don't know what the applications will be and there aren't any in mind, I sincerely doubt that there will be no applications at all. Second of all, with the actual technology that goes into building the LHC, um, it, if it wasn't for CERN, who developed the World Wide Web, we also wouldn't have things like touchscreens. So there's a lot of other technology that's coming out of there, as well as this fundamental research. Thank you very much. <laughs>